All right, everyone, we are here with a very special guest. We have Alexis Haynes, formerly Alexis Nyers, here on the podcast. We are super excited to talk to you. I think you're one of the most iconic pop culture reality moments of this decade, not decade, this, what's the century? Century. 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 I was thinking, <laughs> no, I was thinking, because I'm thinking- Past two, 20 years. I'm thinking 2000 on. Yeah, past 20 years. Yes, 2000 In on. the 2000s. Yes, <laughs> yes, In correct. In the 2000s, I'll take. In the 2000s yeah. is, is really what I was going for. But Alexis, thank you so much for coming on our show. Thanks for having me. So very exciting. Um, I do think that our listeners, I'm 100% know exactly who you are. Uh, but if not, Alexis, how would you introduce yourself to our audience? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, well, presently, uh, I'm a sober woman. I have 11 years of sobriety. I'm a mother of two. Um, I have a podcast myself and I've written a book. Um, but people probably remind, remember me from the bling ring, my involvement in the bling ring and my reality show on E! where I had that very iconic phone call with Vanity Fair writer Nancy Jo Sales. <laughs> so most people probably will remember me from that. Breath at the same time, yep. go ahead. So Netflix is now coming out with a documentary about the the bling ring, which, you know, honestly, I was not too familiar with what had happened um, a little bit. Like, I remember it vaguely. And now, uh, obviously, with you coming on the show, I, I dove a little bit deeper. And now I'm very excited for this this three-part documentary to come out. I think it comes out September 21st. Yep. Um, so that is next Wednesday, or I don't know if this will be yeah, out by then. Week. But uh, I think people are very, very intrigued about the entire story, how it all happened, the aftermath, everything about your life um, has been very fascinating and the story as a whole. So do you feel like this documentary will clear up a lot of the misconceptions that were made about you and more things come to light? Yeah, I think it does a, a really good job of that. Um, Miles did an excellent job of, of really getting into the, the underbelly of this story. Um, I think that back in 2000, in the earlier 2000s, media and just the way that we reported things was so different than it is today. Um, that was kind of like the pre-woke era, right? And so there was no space for like the nuance and the complexity that came along with um, crime and like what actually happened and miles did a really really good job um on on talking about all of that and just how you know the the kids involved with the bling ring kids one of them being me i was 18 <laughs> um i think that everyone at the time liked to point their fingers at us and go oh my god these celebrity obsessed kids and um, two things there. One, yes, Nick does talk about how we're celebrities obsessed. And of course, growing up in this time where we were consuming so much media than the generation before we were, but we all had different motives um, as to why we partook in this crime. And I think that that was really missing from the narrative. I also think that it really so beautifully lays out miles did a really good job at this at, at talking about how everyone wanted to become famous off of this case and so while everyone was pointing their fingers at us like oh these kids who are so obsessed with becoming famous it's like the detective wanted to become famous mm -hmm. the um my lawyer you know it's like when you actually look at the yeah the belly of the beast that is fame and our desire to be famous it it's across the board. It's not just us. Yeah. So is it, did a good job. is it true that the one of the officers that or the detective that was involved with the case took a role in the movie Bling Ring, which then lessened your sentence? Lessened? Uh, that wasn't me. That was Courtney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <after. laughs> yeah. <laughs> But um, allegedly, yeah. no, uh, yeah, there was um, a, a lot of 
really corrupt stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, even one of the, the, that detective Brett Goodkin, um, he refers to me as hot being hot mm. in one of the interviews that he's doing with one of my co-defendants. Um, and he allegedly went on, and this is based off of texts that I've seen. Um, and there was an LA times report about this, uh, from what I recall, went on to basically sexually harass, um, someone who was in my life, um, who is possibly going to have to testify, um, in my case and then he uh, played himself in the movie and when that happened the judge basically was like at this point you know there we can't put this girl on trial because it's just become so muddy and so messy and so courtney i believe um and and mind you like courtney nick and rachel were the ringleaders um you know, Courtney probably would have gotten a little bit more time than me because she was involved a little bit more from what I understand. Um, it, but she got off with like a, a couple of years of probation. Have you I mean, when this when the movie came out and I I watched the um, we, we've seen the trailer for the documentary. So we see there's like kind of a moment of where you say, like, I was made out to be the leader of what was happening. Um, and I do feel like the movie kind of fed into that narrative also. When that all happened, how did you react? I think yeah, by the time that the movie aired, I was used to it. Yeah. Um, I, at the time of my arrest, it was definitely jarring. It was not what I expected. Um, and it was really challenging because I was basically on like a gag order from everyone on the team. Like I was only allowed to do my show. And then of course do that, you know, one interview with Nancy Joe sales. So those were the only people I was allowed to talk to. So I wasn't able to like defend myself publicly and it really wouldn't have mattered if I had anyways, because I think people just had their, they just wanted to run with it. The, you know, sex sells, the story wouldn't have sold. It wouldn't have lasted very long in the media if it was just about two kids who, you know, robbed a bunch of celebrities. It, it would have made it a couple news cycles and we all would have moved on. But um, the fact that this young, um, conventionally pretty girl who had her own reality show partook in it. It was like, we're going right. to, you know, we're really going to run with this now. And, um, and yeah, I became the face of, of the bling ring. And um, it's nice. It was nice. And um, to just finally have that to put to rest, because I still get people DMing me saying, fuck you for robbing Paris Hilton, you fucking bitch. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> I still get those messages from time to time. Um, but also it just speaks volumes to like when the media wants to have a narrative, it goes with it. it. I was never charged in any other burglary. Nick never said that I was involved with any other burglary. I, I don't really know how they got away with that reporting and constantly, even in even in the movie, in the trailer, um, it's challenging for me because it says Alexis Nyers and Nick Prugo were in the bling ring who robbed the homes of, and then it lists all of these celebrities. Yeah. But I didn't rob all of these yeah. celebrities. I wasn't, you know what I mean? And so yeah. it is really challenging. Um, but, you know, Nick really wanted to take responsibility for that in the movie he does. Um and he actually says something to the extent of like that it angered him that I became the face of this thing and that, you know, essentially he wanted the to take the crown. And so by all means, have the crown. You be the bling ring leader. I'm just going <laughs> to go back to living my quiet life, please. Yeah. What was the what was the timeline like? when you were, when the bling ring was active, but then you were 
filming pretty wild because it was like what did the, yeah. the rea- did you decide to do the reality show before that part like happened in your life or and then it just all came together at one time yeah so um we signed our contract with e in june of 2008 and uh we I was a re- the crime happened the following month and then we started filming in October and I was arrested on the second day of filming. Okay. Shit. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. That is really wild. And how many, because you said they list all of these homes of these celebrities, how many were you actually involved in? One. 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 Okay. Orlando one's house. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's just, it's, it's, how connected have you like i know nick is in the documentary as well um was there an opportunity for others to be to participate or have you had any like connection with any connection communication with these people uh in the last few years so um i only knew nick i briefly you know i knew because of the the community we lived in, like I knew Courtney Ames, I'd spent a little bit of time with her and Rachel Lee, but not like, like, you know, at parties or whatever, not like hanging out together. Um, you know, it wasn't someone that I would consider a friend, but, um, and Diana went to the same high school that I went to. Um, and so it was very weird fighting this case with a bunch of co-defendants that I essentially didn't know. Cause the only person that I really knew and spent time with was Nick Prugo. And so Nick, uh, Nick and I met in, we only knew each other for about six months before this happened. And then nine months before we were arrested and at the time of our, I, I had no contact with him from the time that I was arrested until this documentary. And I still don't have contact with him. Like he doesn't have my phone number. You know, he tags me in a bunch of stories on Instagram and stuff, but I don't, yeah. we don't talk. Yeah. Um, I, this documentary was originally supposed to be Rachel and I, and that was because I randomly ran into Rachel a couple of years ago. Um, she actually was the assistant for my hairstylist. And I hadn't seen any of the members since. And then um, I went in to see this like very bougie LA hairstylist mm-hmm. guy to cut my hair. And all of a sudden there's Rachel. And I'm like, and she pretended not to know me. And I was just, you know, she was probably so scared because I don't mm-hmm. think her boss knew anything right. about her involvement with that. Um And so after we stepped outside and I just was like, how are you? Are you okay? Like she did time, time, you Mm -hmm. guys, like she did years in prison. Um, And she was like, no, I'm really good. And, and then, um, you know, we started to get presented like, this was just so random that HBO and Netflix started talking about the idea of doing this documentary and and I had decided to go forward with Netflix and I thought she was on board um we had had like a a long conversation where you know she was just so sweet and she was she was really trying to rebuild her life like I I was impressed with how dedicated she was to healing and doing what's right because that's not easy. Like after committing crimes and having a felony on your record and rebuilding your life is really tough. So we sat down and talked and she was like, I just don't know if I could do it. Like, I don't know if I'm ready and I'm just going to think about it. And then I got the news um, that she was pulling out and then they decided to move on with the project with Nick. But um, yeah, to my understanding, everyone everyone under the sun got an opportunity to be in the documentary and the people who wanted to do it did it and the people who didn't did it. Now, do you remember what the conversation was like between you and Nick when you decided to rob Orlando Bloom's house? Like, how did that go down? Is it Because I'm sure when you're at that age, it, it seems more like a funny thing to do. And then well, it, ha- it wasn't funny. Not, no, 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 it's not a funny thing to do. But, you know, 
you did it. So it was kind of like, oh, let's just do this. Yeah. So um, I I knew what was going down, but I wasn't involved in like the planning of what was going down. And the reason I agreed to go is because honestly, I was a junkie who needed drug money Mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't have access to funds at the time. Um, You know, we hadn't started filming and my addiction had gotten really bad and I had been kicked out of my parents' house because I could not show up sober. And I was a nightmare. My poor mom that, you know, I can't imagine having to deal with your daughter when she's strung out on heroin and Xanax and alcohol. It's not fun. Um, I was disappearing all hours of the night and I was, you know, it was not good. Um, And I just totally got off track. What was the question? I don't know how I just... No, it was about the uh, conversation that took place before it happened. But I'd imagine you you saying that, you know, you were going through addiction and all of that had to be kind of... Yeah, take the money. You'll do whatever it takes. Kind of has to be frustrating when you see the way it's represented in a movie or everywhere else. And you're like, they don't really know what I was really going through or why I made these decisions because you were dealing with like a severe addiction. Well, that's, a th- that's the nuance that was lacking that I was talking about. Yeah. Like I, I, crime doesn't happen in a vacuum. Addiction doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't just happen because one day you decide to, you know, mm-hmm. take part in crime. Like everyone has a motivating factor and all of our motivating factors were different. I can only speak to mine. Um, you know, this is kind of where Nick and my, viewpoints and granted uh i was under the influence at this point i don't need to save face i'm owning the fact that like i robbed orlando bloom's house you know and like i was going to parties and jacking money from like i was a piece of shit human like i'm here to like fully own that um you know uh this this is kind of where there's this point of contention between the two of us um And so I will just say this, that like, I knew what I was doing, but I wasn't involved with like the planning of that. The planning happened between Nick and Rachel. They, they planned every other robbery. Um, I just showed up that night and I was a willing participant. No one held a gun to my head, you know, and I made that decision and it, and it's a decision that, um, I feel awful about. I don't have any regrets because it was the thing that ended up saving my life. Um, But obviously that shouldn't have been at the expense of another individual. And so, um, yeah, you know, and in the documentary, Nick, you know, he says that, you know, him and Rachel had during the planning of this, you know, they said that they were going to basically keep and set aside and somehow, I don't know if they went to the house beforehand. That's the other thing too. Cause I know they robbed these houses on multiple nights, but essentially that there was going to be nothing left for me, that they were going to take all of the Rolexes and all of the expensive things and um, keep them for themselves. And so it's kind of like, well, what is it, Nick? Like you're seeing right, that right. I was involved in all of the planning and I knew all of the things, but here you are also saying that like you and Rachel had this plan in advance and that, you know, you had this, um, ulterior motive. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, uh, I, I took part in the robbery. Um, I specify in the documentary what I took and the reason why, and I'm fully owning it. Why do you think that he said that they were planning on taking all of the expensive things at a different time than when you were going? Like, was that, to set you up or 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 what i don't think so i think that they just at that point they had their own motives and their own setup like i don't i don't know what they were doing with all of paris hilton's jewelry i don't know what they you know i never saw any yes nick gave me clothes um uh but i never saw like expensive jewelry or you know anything like that or like loads of cash or (laughs) you know what i mean like things like that were that was not my (laughs) experience at the time so, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what his motive was in that other than, you know, they wanted the most for themselves. And for whatever reason, you know, they wanted to get me involved. And 
you know, they did the same thing with other members too. And I don't, I don't get it. You know, they had a thing going between the two of them and I'm not sure why they started to bring in um, other people, uh, but they did. Yeah. So, you know, you, you served your time and afterwards, I think that was what you say is the beginning of your uh, sobriety journey. Can you talk to us a little bit uh, about that and what made you at that point decide to get sober? Oh, it was not a decision. I wish, (laughs) you know, it wasn't a decision. It was like sheer desperation. And I always talk about how like I was desperate, but I was unwilling for a really long time. Like my life was in shambles. Um, You know, I I was sentenced. I did uh, my time. I got out. And at the time, I could clearly see how like my relationship with opiates was a problem. Um, You know, I now know in recovery that opiates and alcohol and really, I mean, sex, all the things were the solution to my problem, that my problem was complex trauma. Um, You know, and that's another thing that got left out of the documentary that I was a little bit bummed about. But, you know, I, I endured a lot of sexual abuse in my household growing up. It started when I was um, four and it lasted until I was eight. And then I was abused by babysitters and my dad's girlfriends. And I grew up with an alcoholic father who was physically violent. Um, And I just, I had a lot of trauma. Um, You know, my father became homeless. God, it was a lot. And so that was the problem. The alcohol and the drugs were the solution. So when I got out, you know, and in jail, we don't reform people. We don't give them solutions so that way they don't repeat. And I was talking earlier today to my cute little glam squad here. And I was saying that, um, you know, I remember when I got out the first time, the cop looked at me and was like, we'll see you in a couple months. And I was like, you fucking asshole. Like, no, you won't. You'll never see me again. Like I did my time. I'm getting the fuck out of here. And sure as shit, I was back a couple months later because now I've got extreme. I got financial issues. I'm a convicted felon. I can't get a job. I don't have a show anymore. I have no money. I have no resources and I'm a drug addict. Like wh- how am I supposed to show up to probation? How am I supposed to not use drugs again? And, um, and I went back to using drugs and my life got really bad, really fast, like worse than it was before. And I don't know how it could have gotten any worse, but it did. And I started using intravenously and I started smoking crack and I, it got really, really dark in that time period between August when I got out and, um, uh, December 1st, which was when I was arrested in 2010 and holy shit, you guys, I'm sorry, can I cuss? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was really, it was really bad. Um, and I'm so grateful for both of my arrests because um, they led me to get into a treatment center. And that's really when my life began to turn around. And I'm, you know, happy to say that I I got and stayed sober and it's been 11 years and some change now. God, 11 and a half years, which is wild. Um, and life is just yeah. so much better. I, like today. Well, first of all, I think we both want to say how sorry we are that you did experience those things growing up. That is ex- extremely, extremely yes. traumatic. And thank and, you for sharing and, it with us. Yeah. And for you to now be in the place where you're at, like you just said, 11 and a half years, and even to be able to participate in a documentary like this where you do uh, you have to relive a lot of these things right. and you you know you've moved on with your life and uh so to kind of revisit that and be able to talk about it shows that you uh, are in a good place now I think because yeah. I don't and, think a lot of people can relive that right and even doing press like this interview right now how has that been on you because I'm sure having to relive all of this and talk about it constantly can't really be an easy thing like mm-hmm. like Fran said yeah um I think a lot of people um, would have the same sentiment that you guys do. Um, But I actually really love this (laughs) because I'm not alone. You know, it's like one in four women are going through, you know, living with a history of sexual assault. Um, 
how many Americans are dealing with depression, anxiety, sex addiction, food addiction, drug addiction, alcoholism. I mean, I would say that I'm more of like the norm than, than not. And so, um, you know, when I started on the path of healing, yeah, it was really hard for me to revisit a lot of these things, but, um, because of the gift of recovery and the work that I've done, there are no long, longer emotional triggers for me. And so when I talk about them and often people are like, God, how do you talk about that without crying? And I'm like, it's just, um, it's just, it's, it's healing. You know, it says when, you know, we recover in, in the program that I chose to recover in, it says we're men and women who can and do recover. And I mean, fully recover. So, um, for me, like the obsession to check out of my reality, uh, left. Right. And I developed this beautiful relationship with myself. And as a result, I get to talk about it and share my experience, strength and hope with people and hope that, they feel inspired to heal and that they know that no matter how far you've gone, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're dealing with and what you're facing, because, you know, I, I've seen a lot in my 11 years of sobriety and there are people who have done far worse that are living with that. Right. And, um, and that, that we don't have to live in shame. Yeah. You know, and that we get to be free of that. And that's such a beautiful thing. And that we get to connect with each other on such a deeper level when we can show up vulnerably and authentically. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, that's great. That's beautiful to hear. I'm glad that you are enjoying doing this. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is great. And I do think, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, the Nancy Joe, and like you said, the Nancy Joe, this is Lex Snyder's <laughs> calling video it has been so culturally relevant for so long because not only did everybody obsess about it when it happened but once you know youtube happened and then social media and now tiktok people remake the sound and all these things that <laughs> yeah, even we saw you redid it which was awesome happens yeah. all the time is that like how many i'd imagine people probably quote that to you all, all oh the God. time <laughs> i'm in the street and someone will go 29 dollars <laughs> Yeah. It, I don't, it'll never die. And I don't want it to like, that's the thing is like, I don't want, you know, someone asked me yesterday, like, it's gotta be annoying with all of the things that you've done in your recovery that people always talk about the bling ring. Right. And it was for a very long time for me. And now it's like, no, I get to own that. Like mm -hmm. that, like we get to own all of the messy parts of us, which are really magical. Like when we can go like, ah, oh, that was really challenging and I made it out on the other side. I'm going to turn this immense amount of pain into purpose and I'm going to help people with it. It's a wonderful thing. And so, yeah, I actually enjoy it now. Um, I recently worked with an amazing artist, Sean, and he made a Nancy Joe. This is Alexis Snyder's crying shirt. I it's saw so that. Good. It's amazing. So cool. On my Instagram and I just love him so much. And, you know, I don't make any money off of that. I just love supporting small artists and um, he's great. So I'm like, whatever I can do to help. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. And I and I think even the way you said before, you're like, yes, I robbed Orlando Bloom's house. And like just the way you you said it is like you've accepted what you've done, but you've come such a long way. And you also mentioned a, a lot of these changes in your life wouldn't have happened if those things didn't happen. Mm hmm. Yeah. And again, I always like to clarify that it should have never happened at his expense. And I'm making a living amends for that every day. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of my recovery process um, because I wasn't able to make a direct amends. Um, and, you know, and I, and I also have so much gratitude for him and, you know, he doesn't need to know that, yeah. but it's true. I do. He saved my life. Like that moment really saved my life. And had that not happened, I don't think I would be alive today. I don't think I'd be doing the work that I'm doing. I don't think I'd be raising two amazing daughters. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of it. So um, it was a gift. It was a really painful gift. It's sad that it had to happen again at the expense of, uh, expense of someone else. But it was the best thing that ever yeah. happened to me. Yeah. Have you have you watched the Sofia Coppola, the movie? No. 
I'd imagine that would probably, I mean, it is Emma Watson. <laughs> yeah. So I just wild. Desire. It's just, I just don't have any desire. Again, it's like, I'm really, um, I am really just health conscious, mental health conscious, yeah. emotionally health conscious, physically health conscious. Um, except for my obsession with Diet Coke. Yeah. <laughs> I'm over here, like I feel I'm you like, on that. You yeah. know, it's like sweet green and whatever else. And I'm like, but I have, you know, I have to have yep. one thing. I don't yeah. drink, I don't use drugs, I don't smoke, I don't do anything. Yeah. I have to have my Diet Coke. <laughs> um, and so yeah, it's like and I'm also just a busy mom. Like who has to, if I'm going to sit down and watch something for two hours, it's not going to be the bling ring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that it is, makes ex- sense. that is extremely have fair. You, um, have you met uh, any of the celebrities that were involved, not that you were involved with them, but just like in general that were involved in any of the, the robberies? Um, no. Hmm. There, it was such a big, like, now and it is I'm so fascinated I can't wait to watch the full series I think everybody's gonna really enjoy it too because it did when this was happening it really was that 2008 height of the obsession with the Paris's Britney's Lindsay's all of the like it was such a huge thing and it's and it's still such a phenomenon now um I think like you know with everything Britney Spears has gone through too people really reflect now also on that time and with paparazzi in the media and how everything was depicted. So I really feel like this plays into all of that as well. And I got a sense that it digs deep into that in the in the documentary, which is out September 21st. Are you looking forward to people watching the documentary? Do you think it's going to have a, like, I'm trying to think of how you would gauge the public's reaction, or is it just like, I'm putting this out and we're done with it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, um, Again, I didn't do this for me, like yeah. <laughs> going into a documentary, you know, I spent a long time denying this. And so going in and like owning it all and talking about it was not easy. Um, and I really, I did it because I want, I hope that people um, walk away from it. And uh, just if they're struggling, that they know that they're, 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 there's a better life yeah. out there for them. Um, and so that being said, I am excited for people to see it because I do want people to feel inspired and I do want this world to become a better place. I know that sounds so fucking sappy (laughs) and annoying, but it's true. And it's like, whatever we can do, even if it means falling on our own sword and having to face public ridicule, because not everyone's going to agree with, you know, not everyone's going to see it in that light and that's okay because everyone's going to view it through the lens of their own perspective perspective but if there's just one little clip or one little thing that someone sees from an interview from this or from the documentary themselves and they go oh my gosh like i need to get sober i need recovery i need to take care of my mental health then that's all that matters yeah that's great yeah i think that's a great message and thank you so much for talking to us and sharing yeah, your story seriously. with us and i think we're very excited to watch the documentary yeah. as well as many others yeah the real bling ring hollywood heist documentary is out on netflix september 21st alexis thank you so much for talking to us we really appreciate it thank you so much thanks for having me